Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I have my Red Sox mask at half mast, but I will take it off. Thank you for being here. Um, several announcements. First of all, we just had a surprise visitors uh, from my youth group uh, of over 50 years ago in Waltham, Massachusetts. These folks are faithful viewers online, but they came up this morning. We didn't know they were coming. So Gail and Denise, welcome. Stand up. Let's give them a hand. They... <laughs> These folks um, survived three years with me in Waltham, which was quite an experience. It really was. And uh, great, great people. We got a nice note here. Uh, you know, when we baptize babies, we, uh, we have quilters that make them quilts. And uh, Kelsey Dowart, who's now Kelsey Edwards, uh, sent a nice note, because we did a baptism. It was during the height of the pandemic at the Dowart's uh, house. And she sent this note, so I thought I would share this with you. Dear um, New Boston Community Church quilters, thank you so much for the beautiful baby quilt. It was such an unexpected, thoughtful, and beautiful surprise. With COVID, Ryan, that's our little boy, has been kept separate from so many community events, but this was a lovely reminder that the community is always there. Thank you for your time and love. And that's a sign from Kelsey Dowart Edwards, so that's very nice, I think. Um, did somebody just steal the flowers, or was I imagining that? I I don't know. Oh, that was last week's flowers. Well, as long as last week's flowers were stolen. Okay, that's all right. Um, Kareen is going to be doing an anthem for us this morning because Sam is away. And um, uh, we are grateful uh, for her talent, which she can sing and play at the same time. Many of us, like me, can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So that's quite, she is a very accomplished lady. We're, very glad to have her. Uh, also, I wanted to mention um, that whoever puts the um, order of service together, that would be me, uh, <laughs> messed up. And uh, so the second hymn's got to be after the children's sermon, so just so <clears throat> people are not uh, surprised by that. Okay, now let's see, do we have, oh, on a sad note, I wanted to notice we lost uh, two good people from our church family. Uh, uh, this week. Uh, I did a service yesterday for Sheila Levine. Many people will, well not many people, but some people will remember uh, uh, Roy from years ago. And remember he was married to Flora when I first uh, came here and Flora died and then he was a pretty lonely guy and he met Sheila who was a wonderful lady and uh, she not only was a great wife uh, in his later days, she was a great caregiver for him as well. And we lost Bobby Hebert this week, Red's wife. So, um, I bring you that. Keep those folks in your thoughts and prayers. Okay, do we have other announcements we should be making? Lynn. Uh, <clears throat> Is this about recycling or? No, okay, go ahead. You have to pay attention. <laughs> so, I am getting ready for our next family fun night, which is going to be on November 13th which is a Saturday evening, and it's going to be an in-the-dark scavenger hunt for families to come and use their flashlight and find things. And um, I am looking for some empty, rinsed out, cleaned out milk jugs because I'm going to be putting a glow stick in them to kind of help find a path along the way. And I'm okay with pints or gallons, but I am not okay with the light block bottles because they won't show the glow stick as well. So if anybody has any empty rinsed out, I don't want the smelly ones with the milk yuck inside. Um, if anybody has any of these, if you could bring them next Sunday, that would be great. Oh, yeah, anything that comes in one of these, even if like uh, orange juice or cider, yes. So um, any kind of somewhat see-through plastic jug that I could put a glow stick in would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. There's Rob back there is waving.
Well, we're, uh, we're back once again for the stewardship drive. And uh, we just want to uh, remind everybody, if you haven't uh, gotten your pledges in, to please do so. And that includes uh, the folks that are fortunate enough to be watching us on, on YouTube as well. So we have some updates, and we'll see if, if Woody's moving up in the world. The, uh, the current number of families pledged is 46. And for a total amount of... I my glasses on. 62,452. 62,452. Little black dot. There you go. He's getting there. He's getting there. <laughs> so we'll have him posted outside along with uh, the pledge forms if you haven't already done so. Yes. <laughs> well, we got twenty dollars for the rope from that Carolyn. I, I saw you with a big thing. It was a gold rope the other day there. <laughs> Are there other announcements? In the back. Oh, Dad. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, um, Joanne McAllister's phone number, please. She texted me months ago, and I can't get back to her. So if anybody has Joanne McAllister's phone number, good. Did you, did you have it before? Because it's the same. It's her cell phone number. Well, that's not working. Oh, really? Oh, Says, I don't know. Well, I can uh, send her an email. She'll send it back. Send me an email. We'll try that. What well, if anybody has a number, give it to Judy. I yeah. don't have a, any electronics but my flip phone. I but you have a phone, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll see if I can get that if nobody okay. else has it. I can't do email. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Craig <clears throat> Anderson's birthday is tomorrow. Whose birthday is that? I know him. Okay. So should we sing a happy birthday? I think we should. Any other birthdays? Anniversaries? Bar mitzvahs? Okay. Oh, and just one further note, we need help uh, next Sunday night. Uh, we're going to do Halloween. We'll, uh, we'll have some folks sitting outside passing out candy. It has to be wrapped in advance. You don't usually do it if you just buy a bag of candy. It's wrapped. But, um, uh, so anybody that can help or bring candy, that's the big thing. Because often, I don't know how this will play out this year, but most years, there's like a, almost a thousand people downtown here in this block uh, getting candy. We usually let them in to use a restroom. This year we're charging for the restrooms, um, uh, but no, I guess we're we're not letting them in. So, uh, uh, but uh, people will uh, be still getting candy. And so, if you and Betsy's going to help, and anybody else would like to help, let me know. That would be great. Okay. Any other announcements? Thank you all for coming. And oh, we didn't take the offering yet, so we should do the worship service. Uh, so, we begin the service with our morning prelude.
we gather to worship the God who came to us in the form of a Jewish man from Nazareth to teach us, to heal us, to show us he loves us, and to teach us to love one another. And let us begin as we sing our opening hymn, which is number 57. I was given permission to do this hymn from Sam, and I need to teach it to you guys just a little bit. So, um, yeah, please stand. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, hymn number 57. So we're going to sing the whole thing twice so that you guys can kind of get an idea of how it goes. It's a lot of fun. Um, just notice that the first two stanzas are repeated. Sing unto the Our unison reading is on the uh, inside back cover of the hymnals. Uh, it is the words of King David, probably the best known words in the Bible, uh, and we now call it uh, the 23rd Psalm. So let us, um, let us read together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. affirm our faith um, in a little portion of the Confession of 1967. It's on the announcement side of your bullet. And let us read together. God has created the world of space and time 
to be the sphere of God's dealings with humankind. In its beauty and vastness, sublimity and awfulness, order and disorder, the world reflects to the eyes of faith the majesty and mystery of its creator. Give me Jesus, and if the uh, spirit moves you, feel free to sing along. <laughs> Thank you, Karina. That was very, very nice. Well, children's uh, sermon. Before we uh, extend ourselves into the children's sermon, why don't we take a morning, a moment to say good morning to those around you, or fist bump, or wave, or whatever you have to do. Here.
Okay, for the children's sermon, I thought I would just talk a little bit about a big word, um, depending on your age, uh, humility. Uh, humility. Now, I guess to make that a little simpler for some of our younger viewers here, I would say humility just means be yourself, but don't think you're better than anyone else. Be yourself, but don't think you're better than anyone else. And I think for kids, especially as you get up into middle school and high school, sometimes um, there are very, almost like levels uh, that we think of people being important. And that extends into the adult world. Uh, some people are more important than others. Some people are, you know, better looking than others. Some people uh, are more athletic than others. Uh, back when I went to school, which was back just after Lincoln had been president, um, but we used to say um, some people were cooler than others. And I think um, in the parable we're going to read here that um, Jesus wants us to... Um, to take that parable, the parable of the, uh, the tax collector and the Pharisee, and to take it seriously. None of us are better than anyone else. Now, we may be able to do something better than someone else, um, but the most important thing is to remember that all of us are important in God's eyes. And so, if you see kids at your school that are um, being picked on by others, step in. Say a word about it. Say, leave so-and-so alone. He's just as good as the rest of us, he or she. There's no place in our society, and there's far too much of it, where some people, because they have more money, or they have more power in the adult world, or in school because they're better looking, or they're uh, better athletes, or something else, makes them better than everyone else. I'm not saying they're worse than anyone else. I'm saying we're all in this together. And every person has something to contribute because God made every person. So that's our children's sermon for today. Don't think that you're more important than somebody else, but also don't think you're less important than someone else. I'll tell you a little story. This is uh, kind of surprised me. When I was in uh, high school, the senior class in the senior yearbook would have a, one of these polls. I don't know if they do this anymore. Kids would vote on who was the most athletic, who was the most intelligent, who was the most likely to succeed, who was the most popular was one. Well, now I had a lot of friends in school and that uh, people were very kind to me. I was elected president of our class when I was a junior, but I never thought of myself as a popular kid I wasn't in the popular group. I mean, they were the football players. I was the last doubles in tennis, and they used to chase us around the locker rooms, the football players snapping towels at us. That's a true story. But, um, so I never thought like I was any big deal. Um, so the day before we graduated, we all went on a bus, the senior class, down to Jones Beach on Long Island to go, go to the beach for the day, and they passed out the yearbooks so you could look at them on the bus. Well. We had several buses, and we had a pretty big class of kids. And um, so I'm reading through this thing. Most popular, they had the three boys and the three girls. I was the third most popular boy in the class. Now, I, I never thought of myself as at all a part of the popular group. The only popular kids' party I ever went to, I rem it was the tennis team's party, because we did have the senior class president and the student council president and various folks on the tennis team. And I remember, I knew this was a big deal because when I got there, uh, there were a couple of people that went out to the car and brought in one uh, can of beer uh, for themselves and one for one of their friends, and then they were smoking cigarettes. And I just kind of stood around telling, telling people silly jokes like I do to you, and uh, people said, wow. Um, but um, I was just popular because I was nice to kids and kids were nice to me. It wasn't, there wasn't anything special about me. Uh, but there's something special about each one of us. 
So just be kind to each other. And, and don't think you're more important, but also don't think you're less important. We all have something to contribute to our school, to our community, to God's world. So that's the children's sermon for today. Now let's um, let's let's get into the. Um, we're going to do the second hymn. Is that right? Yes. We move to the second hymn. Okay. So, and then I'll do the scripture and the sermon. How's that? So the um, uh, the second hymn. Uh, is number 100. Scripture reading is a great one. It's from the 18th chapter of Luke, beginning with the ninth verse. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing off, far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And here ends our reading. Does anybody here know, how long does it take a cat to have kittens? I mean, once the kittens are, you know, kind of inside the uh, the lady cat, how long does it take? Does anybody know? I, I don't know either. But you know, I had a, a friend uh, several months ago who was concerned about his cat uh, because he said the cat had uh, had been playing with a ball of yarn and decided to eat it and swallowed the ball of yarn. Uh, then I talked to him a couple of months later. I can't remember how long ago it was. And I said, how's your cat? Is it still alive? And he said, oh, yes, she just delivered a, lit- a litter of mittens. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got a thumbs down from my wife on that. I don't know. <laughs> well, this story... Uh, in a Jesus parable uh, produced uh, the best sermon I ever heard. Um, you know, if you think about all the sermon, boy, you folks here have been so tolerant. You've heard almost uh, 39 years worth of, the, of me speaking. Uh, my apologies. Uh, but, I mean, do you remember any sermons? I, I, I can remember a couple sermons. If I do a sermon I like, I, I've I sometimes uh, keep it, and uh, I probably have about five of those in the drawer. But um, uh, this uh, this sermon, this scripture reading, produced the best sermon I ever heard, and it was it was given by one of my best friends, who was not a minister. He was just out of high school at the time. 
didn't become a minister. He became a college professor. And now he's a terrific carpenter. Denise knows him. Um, uh, my friend Chuck Sewell, uh, who I, we just saw this summer. He and his wife were up volunteering at Geneva Point Camp. One of the best people I know. I mean, he and his wife, Gina, both of them GPC folks. And actually, Denise met her, her husband in, in our youth group down in Waltham, and then they both worked at Geneva Point Camp. So, uh, but anyway, uh, we used to have services done by the, the workers up at Geneva Point Camp on Sunday nights, and uh, Chuck gave a sermon about the Pharisee and the publican. Only talked about it in words that we would understand he talked about it in terms of students in high school. And this probably extends over to college to some degree uh, with fraternities and sororities and all that kind of thing. But um, the Pharisee uh, was, uh, in his account of this, the popular kids. You know, they had all the right clothes. Um, they were bright. Uh, they were good looking. They were athletic. And then uh, there was the tax collector. Um, tax collector were the kids that weren't cool, uh, weren't good athletes, uh, weren't geniuses, weren't, uh, didn't have the best clothes or the latest fashions. Uh, it was a powerful message, and I think that influences people. Now, some of you uh, might have noticed in the bulletin that uh, the flowers today, my wife and I gave in memory of our daughter Amy, who died a year ago of alcoholism. It's her, her birthday is tomorrow. And... Um, you know, as a parent who has lost a child, you're always asking yourself, what did I do wrong? What, what happened? Um, I don't know, but I know that um, Amy was doing pretty well in, in school out in Pennsylvania. We moved here. It was a big move um, for our kids as well as for us. I moved to Merrimack from Meadville, Pennsylvania. And I think she struggled in, in school, not that she wasn't bright, but to be accepted by kids that had grown up in the same town all their life, and she was new, and it's pretty scary to go into a school where you don't know somebody. Now, probably there are many other factors uh, that are included when someone falls into an addiction, which is a disease. Uh, but I certainly think that um, each person needs to be considered carefully, and when there's somebody new, we ought to go out of our way to make them feel welcome. That's true in church. Uh, when somebody new comes, like Jim is a, a fairly new person in church, sitting next to Carolyn back there. I hope people take time to say hello to somebody, make them feel welcome. I think that's important. Now, there's far more that goes into addiction than just that simplistic explanation, but I, I sometimes ask myself, you know, should we have moved or should we have, I don't know. I don't know. Well, last week we talked about that God speaks. We gave a sermon about does God still speak? And, and I tried to suggest that God does speak. Um, for those of us that are believers, he speaks to us still in the words of Scripture, the teachings of Jesus. Uh, but you have to uh, look out in the world, too, at large. Does God still speak? And um, I think he does through the events and people in our lives. But the question is, are we listening? Do we take time to listen for God's word as we find it not just in scriptures, although that's very important, um, but also in the world, in people in our personal lives that we share life with, with people that uh, are in the world yeah, whose words and actions affect us, um, the events of our personal lives and the events um, that we experience as citizens uh, of the world that affect us. And how do the words of Jesus and the life of Jesus impact how we interpret the people and events of our lives and of our world? I came across an interesting quote the other day. I'm not sure that Albert Einstein was at all a traditional believer. He certainly was one of the most intelligent men that ever lived. Um, but he said this, I had never heard this uh, until I saw this the other day, if one purges the Judaism of the prophets and Christianity as Jesus taught it, of all subsequent additions 
especially those of the priests, one is left with a teaching which is capable of curing all the social ills of humanity. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement by a pretty intelligent gentleman. Um, it's pretty amazing, and it's something to think about. But we have to listen. We have to listen. Um, we have free will. We can listen or not listen. Um, that's included in free will. We can uh, try to listen and look for God's will in our lives and in the world, or we can choose not to. Now, in this story that we read this morning, the Pharisee follows the letter of the religious law. I mean, if anybody was on top of the game in terms of doing all the things that people kind of added into the religion of Judaism, all the laws, not just the Ten Commandments. You know, the Ten Commandments were followed by some 400 laws uh, later on in the Old Testament of things you're not supposed to do and some uh, 300 plus things that you are supposed to do. So there were all these laws, sometimes overwhelming to think about, you know, I'm sure. And uh, here comes the Pharisee into the temple. Well, this fellow is, he's hot stuff. He walks right up to the altar. He doesn't even probably bow his head. He looks up to God like he's doing God a favor to address him and says, Lord, thank goodness I'm not like this schlepper, to borrow a term, uh, this schlepper back here. Well, he's a terrible person. He, uh, you know, he cheats, he cheats us all on our taxes and keeps some of the money, which is true. Uh, in those days, if you were a tax collector, you collected what the Romans wanted, and if you could bamboozle people into giving more, you got to keep it. So tax collectors were not very popular, understandably so. But this Pharisee uh, is almost saying to God, boy, you're lucky to have me down here because we got too many people like this guy. They pay no attention uh, to your laws, and I'm perfect in terms of doing what I'm supposed to do, Lord. Probably almost waited for a thank you from the altar. And then comes the tax collector, the Pharisee. Or the Pharisee steps aside. He's, he's satisfied. He goes home and has a nice meal. And the tax collector doesn't even raise his eyes to the roof of the temple. He simply says, God, forgive me. I am a sinner. He asks God for forgiveness. I think um, he does something that is in short supply these days, unfortunately. He has self-introspection, and he has humility. Both of those things are qualities that are important, I think, in making the world a better place. I do think God speaks to us today in the events of our time, but do we listen? Do we listen? And because if we do listen, uh, then we know that really it's not what percentage of our income we give to the church or uh, how, uh, how morally sound we are, because we're not morally sound unless we have some things that God is interested in in our lives. Do we practice as best we can empathy for other people? Do we practice compassion for other people? Do we have a commitment to justice, to seeing that people are treated fairly, whatever their situations? And do we have a realization that life is about not just me, it's about us? I, uh, I probably have used this line in other sermons or uh, other places, but I think it's no accident, really, that the initials for our country is not M-E, we are U-S, us. And I think it, there's no time that I can think of in my lifetime is more important to remember that than now. So I would close with the, um, the words of a very humble man, but one of my heroes, and uh, just, I think, a great spokesman for God in this time. He's the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, Pope Francis. 
I read a quote he gave the other day, and um, I thought it was pretty powerful. Here is the Pope in much more eloquent words than I've used here. Rivers do not drink their own water. Trees do not eat their own fruit. The sun does not shine on itself, and flowers do not spread their fragrance for themselves. Living for others is a rule of nature. We are all born to help each other, no matter how different and difficult it is. Life is good when you are happy, but much better when others are happy because of you. Some food for thought from our friend in the Vatican. And let us bow together in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we confess that sometimes we like to think that we're better or more important than someone else. We ask your forgiveness. We thank you for the words of Pope Francis reminding us that we're all in this together, that we all should be, all of us especially, who are committed to following you, thus must be concerned, compassionate for, helpful to, supportive of one another. And everybody else, be they believers or non-believers, or believers in a different way. We're all in the world together. Give us the wisdom with our limited power as just individual people and as a small church in a small town to encourage people to come together for the common good and to take special care for those who don't feel very important who feel poor, and maybe are poor financially, who feel alone, who are down. Help us lift them up and help us lift one another up to make a world more pleasing in your sight, a world that is healthier because we are together. We pray in Jesus' name, and we pray the prayer which he taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. continue to worship as we share our tithes and morning gifts.
God, we ask your blessing upon these, our gifts, and upon all of us. May we be your disciples, we ask in Jesus' name for your help. Amen. Just a reminder, there will be coffee outside afterward. You're all welcome. Be sure and say hello to Gail and Denise. They'll be signed to, glad to sign autographs. And um, our closing hymn is number 82. <laughs> forth into the world in peace and be of good courage. Render to no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all of God's children, rejoicing in the power of God's Spirit. May God's Spirit bless us, each and every one, now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great day.